But this 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 was a revelation to me, a news to me that uh, uh, even Yahoo was uh, in the name which was there even before uh, uh, the starting of, uh, earlier than uh, the uh, Adamic times. And no, no, fact, no, 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 that's not. You see, yeah, the that's, earth, that's, that's what they have written. No, and that's what not they have true. said is huh. this Yah got translated into Al Yah, Allah in Arabic. That Allah may be. in Arabic is Al Yah, Al Yah, yeah, yeah. Allah. That may be. That. that may be. This is a bit contrary to what we have understood because God, Creator God, was Ail, and then yeah. into Moses subsequently. Yeah. He may reveal himself as Yahweh. Yeah. Yahweh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Right. I am the time. Yeah. yeah. That's why I refer to the passage in Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, where it says, By my name Yahweh, I did not reveal myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I'm revealing myself to you as Yahweh. So now, after the time of Moses, the two become one. So that, in fact, last uh, Saturday I pointed out, that's how you get the expression, um, the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God. Uh, so the Lord actually pertains to <coughs> Yahweh, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> and God pertains to Elohim. So thereafter, it becomes one. Anyway, I just wanted us to realize that what we have come to inherit as Christ, the Judeo-Christian tradition implies a very long tradition, a long process. And um, uh, <clears throat> it is necessary to realize this in order to acknowledge to ourselves that no spiritual tradition stands still. It evolves, which uh, many people find very difficult to accept because it's easier to relate to something that is crystallized because then you don't have to remain vigilant. That's why it's easier to relate to people who are dead. When you relate to living human beings, you have to leave a margin for the irreducible core of mystery that every human being is. Whereas when you relate to a person who is no more, you can actually fix and formulate that person and relate to that person in a very convenient and comfortable manner. So there is a natural tendency in human nature to prefer to relate to that which is fixed and fossilized as against that which is living, dynamic, and emerging. See, my understanding of this phenomenon is like this. If we believe that God is the creator of the universe and also realize the simple fact that we know only a very, very microscopic particle of the universe, there is surely a great deal more about God that we still need to know. If on the other hand, God is an idol, we can actually go on a mental holiday. You make an idol, place it somewhere, it still sits there. There is, no, there is no need to seek an idol. You only need to place an idol. It stays there. So the living God is different from that. Relating to living God is a continual unending challenge. This is the reason why in the Bible, every now and then, the word walk it, the verb walk is you walk in the way of the Lord. Then, of course, in the New Testament, seek and you shall find. The need for this arises only because spirituality is an open-ended system, an open-ended experience. 
the last word is not said yet. But whatever is given to us is like the talent entrusted to the servants through which more talents have to be sought. Now for us, it so seems that the third servant did better. He was actually practically very wise. He didn't want to run any risks. So he went and dug a pit and buried it so that when the master comes, he can return it as it is. You understand? Unfortunately, why did Jesus teach this parable? Because he was very clear that this is the way people relate to everything, including themselves. So that parable of the talents has multiple layers of meanings, starting with the individual predicament, going on to how we relate to the whole world. A human nature or human personality devoid of the dynamism of seeking continually is like the third servant who went and buried his talent in the ground. You understand? Because the simple fact, my dear friends, is that if you seek, you will find. Finding means that which you have never seen before. Okay? Jesus is saying, seek and you will rediscover. Jesus is saying, seek and you will find. Find what? Find what you have never seen before. And if you are seeing something that you have never seen before, obviously the simple uh, uh, conclusion is that you will have to change. And change is an integral aspect of growth. Can you grow without changing? Once upon a time, you were a hand baby. Then you became a playful child. Then you became a tumultuous teenager. Then you became a handsome, winsome adult. Then you gradually slided into the middle age. Then you sort of crept into my stage, which is old age. But all these, though we use different types of verbs and words to denote it, all these are natural and necessary aspects of living in this world, which is a process of continual change. Only a dead body can be frozen and kept as it is. But if the dead body is buried, it will change. But if you put it in a, in a morgue or something, it will stay as it is. But then it doesn't have life. So this is the reason why I thought we should look at how the idea of God underwent a certain evolution because of the changes in the historical condition of the existence, the struggle, and the national revolution of Jews as a people over a period of, say, 4,000 years. Okay? So now we'll take up from there. Now, when we concluded the session last Saturday, I said that to acknowledge God as a Father in Heaven is to move from the ethics of prescription to the ethics of aspiration. Okay, you remember that? I did not have, to, it's a very, very important idea. I did not have time last Saturday to explain this, and that's precisely what I want to take up now. Now, one of the key issues in the New Testament whether it is in the teachings of Jesus Christ or in the epistles of Paul, 14 of them, the key issue, one of the key issues is what is the validity of the law of Moses or the laws of Moses? 
If you recall the Sermon on the Mount, we find Jesus consciously transcending the law of Moses. He says, you have said this, you, you have heard this said by them of old times, uh, uh, do like this or don't do this, but I say unto you. So Jesus is conscious of, conscious of the fact that he is now urging people to take the next step forward. And if you're familiar with the history of the early Christian communities, you will know that this was a very sore point of debate, particularly the great conflict between the Hebraic Christians centered in Jerusalem and the Hellenistic Christians who resulted from the missionary journeys of Paul and the large scale conversions that he effected and his church planting, especially in key areas. And as you know, most of the epistles are related to, in fact, all relation, epistles are related to the various centers of Christianity that Paul established. So a great conflict arose between the Hebrew Christians or the Judaic Christians with the center of authority located in Jerusalem after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, as we know, that his younger brother James became the elder of the group in Jerusalem. And the supreme authorities in that group were James, number two being Peter, number three being John. So James, Peter, John. They were the virtual triumvirate in the Jerusalem church or the Jerusalem tradition. Whereas the Hellenistic Christian tradition centered almost entirely on Paul, and I'll have occasions to say more about it in, co in due course. I will not say uh, anything more for the time being. Now, the moot point in this context was the spiritual status of circumcision. As all of us know, the circumcision was deemed an absolute must by the Jews. You couldn't be a Jew unless circumcised. So when Jews got converted to Christianity, the way of Jesus Christ, the old hangover remained and the Jerusalem-centered Jerusalem new church began to insist that those who joined the way of Jesus Christ must also undergo circumcision. Whereas Paul who was ministering to the Gentiles and gaining converts from among them who did not share the Judaic background of circumcision felt that it was unfair, unjust, and in fact, stupid to impose this Judaic requirement on the Gentile church. Now, this became a very, very serious conflict between these two huge traditions in the early phase of Christianity. That is, the Hebrew Christians, the Hellenistic Christians. Okay? So, <clears throat> According to Paul, if you insist on circumcision as a necessary ritual for all who embrace Christianity from the Gentile background, you'd actually shut the door against a large number of people and thereby you will do a great disservice to the way of Jesus Christ. On the other hand, James and his followers argued that Jesus was from start to finish a Jew. After all, he said, as in Matthew 5, 17, that it, it did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And therefore, obedience or faithfulness to Jesus Christ also included adherence 
to the Jewish system. And therefore, every aspect of the Jewish system has to be maintained. Now, there is a specific reason why I am trying to bring this forward for our thinking today. In my opinion, and I say this after a lot of examination and reflection, we, even after 2,000 years, remain seriously confused about this issue. Are we Jews or are we Christians? What is the extent to which the Judaic hangover actually limits and corrupts our freedom to follow Jesus Christ? It's a very, very serious issue. I don't know if this has occurred to you, but I would commend this to your continuing investigation, reflection. When you read the Bible, please pay attention to some of these things. Then the reading of the Bible would, would become a far more stimulating experience. Now, <clears throat> this also raises the role of orthodoxy. Because after all, in our terms, James and his fellow elders like Peter and, and John they were trying to be orthodox. And as uh, Zach reminded us in one of the sessions, orthodoxy means strict adherence to correct belief. So doctrinal purity. Now the problem is this. Tradition, in our very limited understanding, is something that formed itself in the past. And I remember making this distinction at that time that there is a radical difference between the understanding of tradition in the East and in the West. The Eastern understanding of the tradition is that it is crystallized in the past and therefore it has to be adhered to. So strict conformity to whatever consists or, or comprises the tradition, orthodoxy, becomes a necessary duty of a faithful Christian. But in the European culture, European philosophy, European tradition, this is not the understanding of tradition. For them, tradition is not something dead and crystallized. For them, tradition is a dynamic thing and it continuously evolve its, evolves itself. And in fact, an important aspect of the European and Anglo, that is British, understanding of tradition is that even, if, even as the tradition um, uh, nurtures individuals, the individuals in turn impact the tradition. You understand? So there is a dynamic reciprocal relationship between the tradition and it, the individuals who subscribe to it. And I'm sure that the European tradition arrived at this very profound insight because of its very regrettable past history of persecuting, her, persecuting, her, persecuting heretics. Who are her, heretics? Heretics were people who insisted on their freedom to reappropriate orthodoxy or tradition as they deemed best. There are two ways of relating to it. One is just relating to orthodoxy as it is, adhere to it in letter. The other is to understand the spirit of that body of belief and to reincarnate it, rearticulate it, express it again in the present context with an air of freshness about it. 
The first is a museum approach, okay? The approach of mere preservation. The second is what Jesus would call the fulfillment approach. That's what he said. I've come to fulfill the law and the prophet. So Jesus himself was implying or adumbrating a very dynamic relationship with the past traditions. Not a passive relationship at all. In fact, this was the main conflict between Jesus and Judaism, the Judaic establishment. The Judaic establishment, because of the complete ascendancy of priestly authority, turned everything into a dead asset. In modern banking language, non-performing assets. Therefore, nothing should change. Jesus said, no, the past is important. All the revelations in the past are very precious. But how we relate to it, how we understand it, and how we actually live it is important. Living it in our times, in our context. So while the past is precious, uh, the way people related to it was imperfect. And because of that, it suffered various distortions and is our spiritual duty to remove those distortions from very profound divine revelations so that the faith becomes a living, vital influence on the life of the people. You remember the, the debate between Jesus and the woman of Samaria? What was the point of the debate? Does God live on this mountain or that mountain? Just imagine. Now, such a debate is possible only if you believe that God can be placed in a spot of our choice. He will stay there. He will not move left or right. He will not act. He will not impact. You understand? There's no other way this can happen. And my point is that in spite of 2,000 years of teaching, proclamation, theology, etc., we have not moved an inch beyond the Samaritan controversy, the Samaritan debate. Does God sit on our mountain or somebody else's mountain? The Martama mountain, CSI mountain, Orthodox mountain, Jacobite mountain, Catholic mountain, Charismatic mountain, more mountain, 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 right? We have not. The fact of the matter is, we have not taken one step forward. And I believe that there's a terrible reality. It is this that virtually amounts to atheism. This is what I call practical atheism. We may not say that God doesn't exist. We only say, or we only imply that God doesn't matter. Once you place God on a mountain top and assume that God doesn't come down from there, then you are free to live your life as you want. God has nothing to do with the way you live, except, of course, when you get into trouble or when some great desire overtakes you and you want to get some favors from God, then you go to some Godman or some priest or somebody and say, put in a word on my behalf, the God who, whom I have placed on the mountain, may do something for me. Beyond this, we don't go. It's a fact. And therefore, Christianity is not a living force. Okay, please, please consider this. I'm sharing a very major issue with you for your continued reflection. So, <clears throat> for example, one social aspect, social implication of this problem that I've highlighted, I'll, I'll let me mention. What is, the, what is the status of Dalit Christians in our midst? Even though we have headhunted them, decoyed them into our midst, even today we refuse to integrate them. Right? Why? Because we fear that the purity of our orthodox practices will be compromised. Why do we believe so? Is it because of what Jesus taught us? No, it's because of the mechanism of the caste system which is operating within us. Our mind operates not in terms of the teachings of Jesus Christ, but in terms of the caste system. 
It is not Christ, it is caste. If you have a disagreement, we can discuss it. I want to be challenged. I want to be proved wrong. How do we account for the plight of Dalit Christians in our midst? Okay, there are lots of other issues. I'm just flagging one for want of time. So, <clears throat> as far as Paul was concerned, Paul being the missionary par excellence, I'm not, I'm not trying to exalt Paul over Peter or, J uh, or James or other, other disciples. I have my reservations about Paul. Also my admiration for Paul. According to Paul, insisting on the primacy of the Jewish law, Jewish tradition, Jewish rituals and practices is a serious issue. And he used, it may surprise you to know, he used very strong words to condemn it. And I'm going to use only biblical text. I'm not going to quote a single historian. What does Paul say about this? He actually referred to the Jerusalem center of Christianity and the leaders like James, Peter, and John in this manner. He called it, and I'm quoting from uh, the second letter to Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. You can no, no, note down these references and check for yourself. And in fact, if you read the epistles of Paul, after we discuss this issue, it will become very interesting. It's very dramatic. Very often we don't have the background to understand the gravity of what Paul is saying in his epistles. Therefore, these are mere words to us. Okay, what does he say about that ministry, about the, uh, the Jerusalem tradition? He says, a ministry of death. Can you believe it? He is referring to the Jerusalem tradition of Christianity presided over by none other than the younger brother of Jesus Christ, James, whose epistle is in the New Testament, the epistle of James, right? It, it, would, be of, it would be of interest to you to know <clears throat> that among the 27 books of the New Testament, the Bible as a whole has 66 books, right? Of which 27 are in the New Testament. A simple information which would be very interesting to you, which would, which would be interesting to you. Of the 27 books, only one epistle, a small epistle is by James, who is the brother of Jesus Christ, the epistle of James. There's only got five chapters, All right? There are two letters by Peter, okay? Only two letters by Peter, who is supposed to be the rock on which the church is to be built. There are, te there are three letters by John, one John, second John, Third John, right? But <clears throat> there are 14 letters by Paul. How many? There are 14 letters by Paul. I'm just citing this to give you an idea of the domination of Paul over New Testament Christianity. It is not only that 14 of his epistles are included in the canon, but that look at a book like the book of Acts of the Apostles, about 80% uh, of it is about Paul. It's not about Peter. It's not about John. It's not about any other disciple or apostle. More than 80% of Acts of the Apostles is about Paul. So, <clears throat> the conflict between Paul and uh, the Jerusalem-centered Christian group must be understood. So, he's referring to that core tradition as what? A ministry of death. Okay? 
Now, I'm sure you'll be able to understand the gravity of the situation. Then he says, chiseled in letters on a stone tablet. After all, your tradition is written on a piece of stone as against a living spirit. You understand the, con the contrast he builds up? Which needs, he says, this needs to be superseded by the ministry of the spirit. You see the contrast? The letter written on a piece of stone versus the continuing ministry, the dynamic ministry of the spirit. Can you think of a more dramatic contrast or conflict than this? And yet when you read the, gospel, uh, the epistles, you simply become unaware of it. I myself remained unaware of it for a very long time. That's why I'm particularly keen that it should be highlighted. Because being ignorant about the scriptural truths is not an achievement. And I'm only citing one or two examples. There are, there are dozens of such passages in the epistles of Paul. Okay, so just note down 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Also note down Philippians chapter 3, verses 2, 3 and 4. Again, Paul's letter to Philippians, chapter 2, chapter 3, verses 2, 3, and 4. And in this Philippians passage, Paul calls those who practice circumcision. Now, I'm going to shock you. These are not my words. These are the words of Apostle Paul. Okay? You know what? You know what he calls them? Those who practice circumcision, he calls them dogs and evildoers who mutilate the flesh. What does he call them? Dogs hmm? and evildoers who mutilate the flesh. None of us can use words stronger than this, am I right? Huh? These days, many people advise me that I should not use very strong words. You know, I, I participate in a, a YouTube channel called Eye to Eye. Um, and I, I do so with a lot of embarrassment myself, I have to admit. But unfortunately, I have to use strong words. So sometimes I remember uh, Paul. So he refers to these circumcisers as dogs and evildoers who mutilate. Let me read that passage to you, okay? So that you get the full flavor of the text. He says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. That's verse 2, verse 3, Second uh, uh, Philippians. Um, sorry, third, third Philippians. Uh, uh, first verse, now, sorry, second verse, now the third verse. For it is we who are the circumcision. Now he is now spiritualizing circumcision. The Jews practiced it in a literal manner. The actual uh, mutilation of the flesh had to happen. Now he spiritualizes it, gives it a symbolic interpretation. We who serve by his spirit, we are inwardly circumcised. We are circumcised by the spirit. So, a um, tool is not required. Okay? So, uh, so, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Jesus Christ, and who put no confidence in the flesh. So, according to him, shifting your faith, your dependence from the flesh to the spirit, is the new circumcision. You understand? What is the new circumcision? Shifting your faith. After all, in the olden days, in the Judaic tradition, you had to undergo circumcision as making a public ritualistic commitment that you will stay faithful to that tradition. Okay? That's what it meant. He says, now we don't need that. When we shift our faith from our confidence in the flesh to the ministry of the spirit, 
we experience the new circumcision, the spiritual circumcision. <coughs> so, so therefore, in light of the why, why I have made a reference to this is, in my opinion, a serious, meaningful, informed debate has to happen in the Christian community in Kerala about the spiritually valid way of responding to what happened? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, George wants to say something. Yes, George. Yeah, the reference is not very clear. It's in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, doesn't speak about a dog or practice. Chapter 3. Chapter, ah, chapter 3, yeah, you said 2. I know, that was a mistake. Okay, okay. Chapter 3. Sorry. You. Sorry for that uh, confusion. <clears throat> okay, well, thanks for checking so that uh, we get an opportunity to correct ourselves. So now, uh, so saying, see, the one thing that is lacking from the Christian culture in Kerala is this culture of debating. We are so scared of a free, open exchange of ideas. We believe that God is a, like a bubble and he will burst the moment you blow on it. Right? Now I find this very puerile, very silly. I find it really insufferably stupid. What are we scared of? Why can't we have a fearless, uninhibited, but informed discussion or debate on some of these key fundamental issues? For example, what should be the role of tradition? For example, take a practice like confession, obligatory or mandatory confession. Can there be a debate on it? No, it is a great scandal. Now, in my opinion, this allergy to debate betrays insecurity, lack of conviction for oneself. One does not know how to defend some of these things. I'm not saying that these things are indefensible. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we do not know how to, we do not know how to defend it. We, actually, we do not know what it means. We simply mechanically conform to certain practices. We have never applied our minds to it. We have never sought through the scriptures to get an adequate understanding of these practices, nor have we thought about these things in the light of the emerging, exploding information available, for example, the psychology, the psychology of confessions. I'm sure there is a great deal to be said about it. Nothing should be, not a word should be uttered. Now, do you really think this is Christianity? Just think about it. That's all I'm saying. Okay, let's move on. So, <clears throat> to relate to the living God, therefore, is to immediately accept the fact that the tradition that we relate to must also be a living tradition and no living tradition can be closed. Okay. Now take water, for example. If water is frozen, it will stay there. But if water is not frozen, if it's in a liquid form, it will flow. It will flow forward or downward. Okay. The river flows right towards the distant ocean. So, <clears throat> To live, therefore, I was reading a book today written by a French philosopher on religion. Well, he says, a very simple short sentence which touched me. He says, to live is to be spiritual. To live is to be spiritual. That's what he says. Okay? So anyway. <clears throat> So, to live is to outgrow oneself. If you are not today a shade better than what you were a year ago, a month ago, even yesterday, then you have wasted a day, wasted a year. Okay? Look at nature. 
you plant a seed what happens the seed sprouts becomes a sapling the sapling gradually grows into a tree the tree begins to flower the flower turns into a fruit the fruit becomes a seed and the seed becomes a sapling it goes on the relentless process goes on right you think it is a good thing for the seed to stay as a seed this is not what i am asking jesus raised this question through the parable of the wheat in john chapter 12 he says truly truly i say to you unless a grain of wheat falls down and dies it will remain alone it's not good that it remains alone right there is no teaching anywhere in the scriptures either in the christian scriptures or in any other scripture that i am even marginally aware of which prescribes that staying frozen is a spiritual achievement yet on the ground the followers of every religion assume that it is so i can't understand this 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 riddle how do you come to this kind of conclusion on what basis and this is actually the religion that we live so <clears throat> but think of him very familiar verse like the uh, the 100 psalm 119 verse 105 your word is a lantern to my feet and a light to my path right what does it mean if you understand the metaphor feet means what walking right why do you need the word of god is it to sit where you are or is it to walk and reach further destinations what is the right use of the word of god unfortunately the word of god is massively misused to constitute a framework for the maintenance of the status quo minister to the status quo that's all that's happened that is why two things the prosperity gospel thrives and this ministry of healing faith healing miraculous healing etc what is our idea of healing i should remain as i am right i should remain i should not lose anything nor do i want to gain anything i should remain a living corpse that's our idea of healing the true idea of healing in the bible and the teachings of jesus christ is healing means making a new beginning jesus makes a difference between curing and healing to be healed is to be made whole to be whole is to shift from the foundation of the partial to the foundation of the full that's what jesus says i have come that you may have life in all its fullness because that's not your plight today human beings by nature want to relate only to a small part of life that's the reason for all our misery in fact the prison in which human beings universally are everyone is that we only want to be in a small part of the possibilities god has invested in us and we call that our comfort zone right and any invitation to emerge from the comfort zone is perceived by us as a kind of insult or threat or conspiracy and we react violently and this is my experience consistently over the last 40 years okay so again i want to remind us that the bible con- consistently talks about walking 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 seeking seeking going right after all one of the most stirring books in the bible the book of exodus is about a great journey abraham the father of the faith became so because of a great and adventurous journey genesis chapter 12 verse 2 go to the land you have never seen before right doesn't that doesn't that involve a very radical change had abraham stayed stuck 
to his father's house in Ur in Mesopotamia, do you think he would have become father of the faith? And how is Jesus described in uh, the New Testament, particularly the letter to Philippians chapter 2? He did not consider the privilege to be seated with God the Father as something to be held on to, but he came into this world, a great journey, right? Great journey. Okay, he came, and then what did he do? He was journeying all the time, right? The Son of Man has come to seek that which is lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Do you find Jesus uh, sitting and vegetating, vegetating somewhere? Did Jesus have an ornate chair? Huh? The foxes have their holes. The birds in there have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And I remember interpreting this for you, saying that this is the core of his dynamism. We think, you know, there was a time when as, a, uh, as an individual, I felt sorry for Jesus. I, he, I mean, I have a place to lay my head, but Jesus hmm, does not have. But today I feel that there's the greatest excitement. Thank God Jesus did not have a place to lay his head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, so the crucial question that Paul faced as he started his ministry to the Gentiles, Paul deemed himself as the ambassador of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. It's a beautiful description, no? Beautiful. I was fascinated by this. He says, I'm an ambassador in chains. Here, chains means completely bound by the discipline Jesus Christ has prescribed for me. And an ambassador in chains for the Gentiles. Okay. So, the real question that Paul faced, and there's a question that we need to confront today. This is a question that continuously bothered me when I was in North India. How to present Jesus to the Gentile world? See, Christians who are living in Kerala have no idea what it means to be in North India as a Christian. It is, it is incomparable. There's no comparison. So, the question that needs to be asked is, how are we to present Jesus to the Gentile context? You know, my friends, the poverty, and I would say the insolence of Christian proclamation in the last so many centuries, and it's increasing in our midst, is that we take our audiences for granted. There is a Christian audience, and particularly the non-Christian audience. We need to have no sensitivity at all. We expect others to listen to us, but we have absolutely no duty to understand them. If you know the rudiments of communication, by the way, the most fundamental thing in communication is that you have a duty to understand the other person with whom you are trying to communicate. You understand? Christian proclamation in Kerala, in India, for, for decades, erred seriously in taking the receptacle that the person who receives, the receptacle of the gospel for granted. No attempt was made to understand it. And therefore, no appropriate strategy for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with Gentiles. Actually, the word Gentile should not be used. That's a classification the Jews used. They divided the world into Jews and Gentiles. What happened? For 2,000 years, they became slaves to the Gentiles. And that's what happens. I would say that our brothers and sisters in other faiths, we have a duty to understand them. And we have also a duty to share the gospel, the good news, as good news. If you read the autobiography of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, titled, The Story of My Experiments with Truth. And I, I recommend that to you. There is a passage in which he says, I was very sensitive to religion from my early days. 
and I, I had an eagerness to understand every faith, I respected every faith, except which faith? Which was the faith that Gandhiji despised? Do you know? It was Christianity. It was Christianity. Why? Because he said that whenever I heard a Christian preacher, he was always abusing Hinduism. You understand? Read, read a sort of. My daughter is trying to call me. I'm just take this in. Hello. Okay, fine. So, in other words, the crudity to which we felt or assumed that we are entitled to others are all duty bound to sit and suffer it. This is a serious issue. And this is why Paul says, I was all things to all people for the sake of the gospel of Christ. I can't give you the exact reference. I'm just quoting from memory. You can easily find it. If you just Google it, you'll get it. I was or I am all things to all people, not because I'm a religious chameleon, but but for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? So that shows Paul's sensitivity as a missionary and as an evangelist. Something that I find not only commendable, but also necessary. So one of the areas in which the Christian community needs to improve is in respect of developing due sensitivity and adequate respect to those who listen to our proclamations so that the good news can be presented as good news and not as insult. Okay, that's a great deal. A great deal needs to be said about these things. Let me move on. Time also is running fast. Now, uh, let me conclude today's session by merely pointing out a very interesting thing. If you read only the epistles of Paul, as I said, 14 of them, and Paul's proclamations found scattered in Acts of the Apostles, you will find that Paul omitted about 90% of the details pertaining to the life of Jesus Christ. It is in vain that you look in Paul for a word about Jesus' birth or any of the rituals that were performed in this connection or how he grew up, where he was, there are only three things that Paul focuses on. One, the last supper that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. Everybody knows that, right? Second, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Third, his resurrection. That's all. You will get only these three things from Paul. Why is it so? <clears throat> this can be interpreted both negatively and positively. I'm going to interpret it positively. In doing so, I don't want to create the impression that other details about the life of Jesus Christ are not uh, relevant or valuable, etc. They're all relevant in certain other contexts. But when it comes to reaching out to people of other faiths, people who are not directly within your fold, here is something that Paul was very careful about. The details about what in technical language theology is called Jesus of history. Note this down. There's a very important thing that I'm going to say now. There are two things. One is Jesus of history. The other is the Christ of faith. You understand? Jesus of history, 
on the one hand and the Christ of faith. Jesus, sorry, Paul effects a shift, it's a very strategic shift from Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of history to the Christ of faith. Why? Because when you are taking the message of Jesus Christ to people outside the Jewish network, this details about the Jewish tradition, background, Jesus' uh, uh, conformity to Jewish practices, etc. In Paul's opinion, you can debate it, I can debate it. In Paul's opinion, it was not of much value. What was centrally significant to the non-Jewish context were these three things. The Eucharist, derived from the Last Supper that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. The passion, the death, the crucifixion, uh, 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 the suffering of Jesus Christ and his death. And finally, his resurrection. Now, therefore, what Paul is doing is that he <clears throat> shifts from the historical elements to the mystical elements. Because the historical elements are local, particular, specific, discrete. And when you take this message to people far and wide who do not share this ethno cult, uh, uh, sort of religious baggage, this could actually serve as a hindrance. So he tries to emphasize the universal and cosmic relevance of what Jesus has done. That's what he's doing all the time. Now you read his 14 episodes, you will find that this is actually true. Paul is not preaching Jesus of Nazareth. I would go to the extent of saying not at all. He's all the time proclaiming the Christ of faith. And this is the reason why now an important insight in the Reformation movement. This is the reason why Paul's emphasis, as Martin Luther correctly understood, was on faith, not on works. Now, if you're familiar with the episode of James, what is James's emphasis in his epistle? It's on works. Have you noticed? The great conflict between James and Paul can be immediately understood. When Paul takes emphasis completely away from works, James reasserts the importance of works. So, sola fide, by faith alone, is derived entirely from the epistles of Paul. There's no bearing on the epistle of James or epistle of Peter, the epistle of John. So, the Reformation movement, in a sense, actually marks a triumph of Pauline Christianity over its rivaling Christian tradition, which in, which in any case was completely destroyed by AD 70. So even the great reprisal from Rome began by AD 66. Practically everything about the Jews, their religion, their culture was wiped out, including their scriptures, their literature, etc. And um, Josephus, the historian, gives us blood-curdling descriptions of the atrocities perpetrated on the Jews by the Roman soldiers under the order of Titus. So, 
the James centric tradition that existed in Jerusalem, which tried actually to influence the various centers of Christianity established by Paul. And if you read uh, Acts of the Apostles, you'll find that James actually sends missionaries to reconvert Pauline Christians to Jerusalem Christians. Because James felt, James, Peter, and uh, John, all three of them felt that Paul's teachings were wrong, Paul's doctrines were wrong. And this was the reason why the great schism happened, what's called the Jerusalem schism happened, resulting in the first council of Jerusalem, AD 56. Then the second council, of Jerusalem, the first council of Jerusalem, I think, took place in 40. The second council took place in uh, AD 56. And then the conflict erupts in AD 56 when Paul came to Jerusalem to have a dialogue with uh, James and his cohorts. James forced him to comply with the Judaic practices. So Paul is made to go to the Jerusalem temple and offer sacrifices in conformity with the Judaic, Judaic tradition. And this was noticed by the Jews who are aware of Paul's teaching that all these Judaic pra practices must be completely thrown overboard. And they say, look at this fellow, he has been teaching us something else. Now he's doing exactly opposite and a riot results. People are about to catch hold of him and kill him. Then the Roman soldiers intervene. That's when Paul claims that he is a Roman citizen. Then he is transported to Rome so that he may be tried there. All this history you can get from Acts of the Apostles. So the point I'm making therefore is we need to understand why Paul deemed it absolutely essential to edit, as it were, Hebraic Christianity so as to make it conducive to a global proclamation. Now, this is a very controversial subject. You can take any side you like. I don't mind. You can argue the, on behalf of uh, James. You can argue on, on behalf of Paul. But what I only want to highlight is this. As context change, it is necessary to be sensitive to the context in, in which you are, so that what you communicate actually gets communicated, right? Now, in my life as an activist, I've had occasion to address large numbers of very, very uh, rural tribal gatherings. I remember traveling through the length and breadth of Haryana uh, in the company of Swami Aknivesh when we were, we were trying to spread awareness about female infanticide, we went from village to village to village, one end of Haryana to the other. We spent weeks on end addressing people. Now, you can't address these meetings the way you address a gathering in Delhi or a group of students in St. Stephen's College. You have to be extremely down to earth. You have to speak their language. And you have to also invent the terminology, the illustrations that are closer to their experiences and not your own pet theories, your own pet terminologies, expressions, etc. So anyway, Paul was an expert in this. For example, when he visited Athens and he found the temple, in the temple an altar that was, not devo that was devoted to the unknown God, what did, he, what did he do? He said, I have come to preach you the, uh, the God you do not know. You understand? It has a big impact. Modern day theologians or uh, 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 preachers will start denouncing the temple. You idol worshippers. No? You who waste your time on blind objects, stones, lifeless things, etc. That's not what he does. He says, I've come to talk to you about the God you do not know. You have this altar there, no? To the unknown God. I've come to tell you about the unknown God. 
that's how creative and shall I, shall we say uh, uh, the degree of presence of mind that Paul had. But these are things to be thought about. Um, I've not really covered the ground I thought I would, but the time is up. We can now take up our uh, topics for discussion. Wilson, can I ask yes, a very, con very controversial yes. question? Yes. There is a book by M.M. Thomas, hmm. The Unknown yes, Christ of the Indian Road, or Hinduism. Yes. Hmm. There are so many Hindus and Muslims that I know yeah. who follow Christ's teaching. Yes. yes. They don't call them Christians or followers of Jesus because they haven't accepted baptism. Yes, yes. In the Indian context, I mean, this is very much like circumcision in the yes. St. Paul's time. Do we have the courage to talk about it openly as Christians? Thank you, Zach. Um, I, I don't know if we have the courage. I know that we must have the courage. And this is the reason why in the course of the previous uh, session, previous course, course on Christianity, we spent an entire session on the baptism of Jesus Christ. And since there are a few members in the present group who were not present at the other, let me very quickly summarize the essence of my argument in that session. If you understand the baptism that Jesus Christ underwent, after all, the baptism of Jesus being the example or model after which the churches say that they have devised their baptism, if you regard Jesus' baptism, Jesus clearly explains or at least indicates without any ambiguity the meaning of his baptism. He says to John the Baptist, it is necessary, he says, suffer this much, it is necessary that we fulfill God's righteousness. You understand? So what is, what is baptism? What's the purpose of baptism for Jesus Christ? Was it the ritual to attain membership in a church or a synagogue or even Jerusalem temple? Not at all. It was making a public announcement that he would remain committed to fulfilling God's righteousness upon the earth. That's the meaning of baptism. What churches have done is they have misappropriated this distorted it, burdened it with a wrong and dishonest teaching, and turned it into a necessary rite, a necessary ritual for church membership. Let me ask you, when Jesus was baptized, did the idea of the church exist? Did it? Secondly, was Jesus baptized by a priest? No, by a prophet. Look at the way the whole thing has been horribly mangled, distorted out of shape. It is this, Zach, that is now hanging like the albatross around our neck. You have got used to this idea that if a child is born immediately, the child must be baptized. What that ritual means to the child, I do not know. Let it be. So without that infant baptism, if the child dies, the child will not go to heaven. Where in the Bible is such a teaching? Give me one half reference. Give me one tenth of a reference anywhere in the Bible. Either in the teachings of Jesus Christ or in the teaching of Paul or anyone. That an unbaptized child will go to hell? Can you imagine anything more horrible than this assumption? I'm sure that an infant dying, if at all anyone goes to heaven, that infant or those infants will go to heaven, even if all the bishops, uh, popes, archbishops, priests like me do not reach there. That I'm very sure about. And yet, when the teaching comes, all infants, five-year-old infants, uh, five-day-old infants, two hour Two hours old infants would all go to hell. Why? The Baptist male waters did not fall on them. 
Well, can you imagine anything more dishonest, anything more stupid than this? And yet, that is considered the backbone of our faith. So therefore, I, I thank uh, Zach for raising this issue. We need to really debate the meaning and the need, both, of baptism. If you are baptized, then what happens? So yes, I fully agree. There are so many, there are so many non-Christians in India who relate to Jesus Christ and his teachings better than most Christians. I'm very, I mean, Swami Agnivish was a classic example of it. Let me say this to you. The man is no more. You know, there are many times I used to be astonished at the sincerity of his commitment to Jesus Christ. He would publicly say that his commitment to social justice was entirely inspired by Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? I still remember uh, he came to my house um, uh, on, a, on the 31st of uh, uh, De 31st December of a year because he said, I would like to spend the New Year Eve with you. So we sat, sat chatting and I thought, you see, he has come. I said, uh, Swamiji, can I, what, what gift uh, can I give you? See, Afro Christians offer gifts. There was a portrait of Jesus Christ, you know, Solomon's head of Christ, three dimensional. Without batting an eyelid, he said, give me that. You know, this Swami Agnivesh accompanied me to um, the convention, where is that? The great convention, Maraman. You know this? I think 2003 or 2004. Because uh, I told him that it was a great experience and he wanted to see it for himself. And that was the first time in his life that he ever undertook a journey to be in a meeting where he was not the main speaker. <laughs> okay? He stayed with me in the retreat center for a whole week. I gently suggested to X, Y, and I said, why don't you give Swamiji 10 minutes? Not in the main session, maybe addressing the youth. So, Uyuh, how can we allow a Hindu to use our platforms? Believe you me. And yet, one day, in the night by about 9 o'clock, Swamiji comes to my room and says, can, can you take me to the kitchen or the retreat center? And I took him there. There are about uh, six or seven workers. They, they were just finishing up the day's chore. So Swamiji wanted to sit with them and we sat on the floor of the kitchen. And he asked them a question. He said, if Jesus were to come to Maraman, where would he go first? to the kitchen or the retreat center or to the convention site. I was translating for him. That is a perception of a man. You understand? There are many people like him, but from our point of view, such people will all go to hell because 20, 30 drops of water did not fall on them. Okay. Anyway, thank you. Please think about it. Huh? Any other any other question? Uh, sir, I have yes, yes, two, yes, yes. two things that I'd like to hear a little bit more about. One is uh, you mentioned about individuals and tradition and how they impact each other. If you can explain more about that. Yeah, right, right. And the other is um, what you mean by the Christ of faith. Good. Paul is a good example. That's why I introduced it. God is a good example of how a tradition undergoes positive and dynamic changes on account of one who sincerely tries to practice it. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the great, the profound shift 
that came into effect on account of Paul. That was what I was referring to as a shift from the Jesus of history to the Christ of faith. And that's your second question, right? Now, think of this way. Had Paul held on to the it, uh, the the Jerusalem uh, uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, the Jerusalem centric ethnocentric baggage of Christianity Christianity would not have for what we can see spread to the far corners of the world can you imagine a man living 2000 years ago when travel was so difficult and the sea was infected with pirates, means of uh, uh, navigation being very crude, incurring extreme dangers to his life, taking the message of Jesus Christ to three continents, three continents. And Paul describes the inordinate sufferings and risks that he had to incur in the process. So, my point is that if Paul were to simply take a carbon copy of the Jerusalem-centric, the ethnocentric Christianity, the story of Christianity would have been very different. So, Paul brought something new into Christianity. And what is it? He loosened the local anchors and gave it a universal relevance, a universal appeal, so that when the message of Jesus Christ is presented to others, it finds readier acceptance. Now imagine, for example, Paul starting off his proclamation by saying, brothers and sisters, you have to be circumcised. There's no hope for you unless you're circumcised. If at, even, if at all you want to understand the message of Jesus Christ, first you have to be circumcised. That would have been the end of Christianity. You understand? Therefore, when a person <clears throat> sincerely, zealously, creatively participates in a tradition, that tradition undergoes a transformation. Okay? Now, take for example, literary tradition, literary tradition. When a really original genius contributes, say, a poem, a story, a novel, or a play, he's not merely making a, a one contribution. He's actually impacting the whole tradition. The tradition has to be now redefined. Or now take Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ brought this message, world spirituality has to be redefined. You understand? After all, human beings from time immemorial have been struggling trying to understand God in their own way. That search, that quest, that thirst is sacred. Whether or not you agree with the findings, it's a different matter. But man's Thirst for God is sacred. Right? Now, Jesus is part of that thirst. Okay? But when, because he came, that human thirst for God becomes something new. So it is not that something remains exactly like this and people in generations to come simply relate to it in a passive manner and leave everything untouched, unchanged. No, a single person coming into that tradition, if he's sincere, if he's earnest, if he's zealous, if he's creative, will make an impact. Okay? Now, if there is absolute no, no impact, then we'll have to remember the metaphor that Jesus introduced. You're the salt that has lost its saltiness. If there is something inside of you, surely. For example, uh, Suppose you belong to a hospital, you are, you are a doctor, now you are not. Suppose you belong to an office. You are a person of 
distinct personality. There is something special about you, and I believe there is something special about every human being. By the very fact that you have joined that place of work, irrespective of your wanting to change it or not in a conscious and assertive manner, effects very substantial changes, very flavor of the place will change. You understand? At least that is a vocation, that's the calling of a child of God. You cannot just be a cipher. You know, when a person is put in the prison, he's only a number, all right? We can't live like that, a number. Uh, till, till the other day, there were 12 employees. Today, there are 13 employees. That's all. On the other hand, because the light of life is inside of you, the light of Jesus Christ shines through you, your presence in that place redefines that place. It is, it is necessary to emphasize the Zen because most people assume that they are mere passive creations of their environments, the circumstances. We are all victims of our circumstances. What can we do about it? I don't think so at all. I believe, and many people say that I'm arrogant. I sincerely believe that I can impact the given context. Even if, I'm, even if it is understood to be arrogant, I believe that it's my duty to do so. I remember when I took over the, as a principal of St. Stephen's College in 2007, there was a massive press conference where I announced the new admission policy of the college. And when I said that 50% reservation will be made for members of the Christian community, there was a near rioter situation, massive reaction. And a journalist from NDTV got up and said, VP Singh did not stay in office for three months. You will not stay in your office for three days. They exactly, ditto the words. You know what I told him? And I told the entire group of, I mean, about at least uh, 70, 80 uh, journalists, both um, digital and print. I told them, I said, it doesn't matter for how long I sit here. Leave alone three days. If I sit here for three minutes, the institution will change. And I, did, I didn't say that out of arrogance. I said that in a matter of fact manner because I sincerely believe that's my vocation. I didn't go there to warm the seat. I'm not a parasite. So if you believe in the power of the faith, you will certainly believe that God sends you into a context to impact that context. Either you are a parasite or you are a transformer of the given context. It's up to you. Therefore, I understand the relationship between a believer and Christianity in a dynamic mode that because I relate to it sincerely, as this faith now goes to others, mediated through my personality, something of a new flavor will be imparted to it. Like the salt imparting its flavor to a, a dish. Uh, I don't think it's my calling to be a parrot, right? Repeating the same thing. Barakamoran, Barakamoran, Barakamoran. Hmm? And you repeat that for five, uh, 50 years, you'll become a moron. That's not our calling. We are meant to be creative people. We are meant to be people, you remember, when the apostles went here and there, people who interacted with them said that the people who turned the world upside down have come here also, right? Why was it so? They were after all fisher folk. Because if the light of Christ is inside you, you have a very different relationship with the given context, no matter what that context is. Okay? Right. Thank you, sir. You left out the faith part, I believe, which is the second question. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes. And now the Christ of faith. Now, notice, very interesting, notice that Paul does not 
use the word Messiah. He uses the word Christ, which is Greek. Messiah was Hebrew. So even in terms of the title, he's clearing away the Jewish hangover. Now, in the passage that I read out to you from 2 Corinthians, when he gives a new interpretation to circumcision, you would have already noticed that he's shifting from the letter to the spirit. So, as against relating to the person, the historical person, limited in his context, in geography, in language, in culture, in mobility of the historical Jesus or Jesus of Nazareth, Paul is now presenting a Christ without limits, a Christ without boundaries, who is universal, who is easily accessible to anyone. Because sim simple common, friend, uh, co common sense, my friends, only such a Christ can be presented to the non-Jews. Okay? So, the idea that Jesus of Nazareth from now onwards would be the Christ of faith. Now, faith is not limited by ethnicity. Faith is not limited by a particular religious tradition. If you're human, you have faith. How you use that capacity for faith is a different issue. But there's no life without faith. There is no humanity without faith. So now human beings all over the world, irrespective of who you are, where you are, hmm, can receive this say, power of God in the form of the Christ, the anointed one with a mission, without any Jewish hangover. And second thing is, while in the Judaic tradition, this relationship had to be mediated through rituals, obligations, practices, in the new context, all this is abolished. All that you need is faith. And therefore, actually, all the mediators are also gone. So if you actually, if you actually accept Pauline theology of the Christ of faith, you'll also have to accept its implication that priestly mediators are not needed. But you can immediately tell me, yes, but Paul instituted a priesthood. Yes, he did that. And that's where the compromise lies. So it is not that Paul strictly adhered to every implication of the new shift that he was bringing. He was very pragmatic. So within context, he used certain emphases. And in other contexts, he used some others. Now, whether that, what I, I sometimes call sanctified common sense, amounts to inconsistency or a worse still to hypocrisy, it's up to you to decide. The fact of the matter is that that was how Paul carried on with this work. I, I'll give you another example of Paul's pragmatism. In Jerusalem, when he's attacked by uh, the irate Jews, and Paul realizes that his life is in danger, what does he do? He suddenly says, I am a Roman citizen. Never before he said that. Right? Never before you've heard Paul saying that. So in that context, his identity is not that he's an ambassador of Christ to Gentiles. His only identity at that point in time. The only identity that the soldiers standing there will understand huh? is that he is a Roman citizen. Otherwise, he loses life there. I imagine a mob is attacking you, 
Roman soldiers are standing by as though, why should we interfere with this local sectarian brawl? And Paul is shouting to Romans, come and help me, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. Hmm? I had a special revelation on my road to Damascus. I am a scholar, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Who is going to listen to him? He would have died that day. So Paul has this very eminent, pragmatic sense. And there are other instances as well. So, so he, when he shifts this emphasis from the Christ of his, sorry, uh, from uh, uh, the Jesus of history to the Christ of faith, he does so in order to universalize the appeal of Jesus Christ and to make him more accessible to people other than the Jews. Okay. So may I ask one more question? Yes, yes absolutely. Um, so do you think you can give us one example of how um, people have creatively represented Jesus in the Indian context? Um, uh, if you're familiar with the work of Dee Nobili, uh, a missionary, of, an overseas, uh, a Portuguese missionary, I think. He presented himself as a Brahmin. Uh, because his missionary priority was to evangelize the high caste. He believed that if the high caste Hindus are evangelized, the rest will follow. Okay? Now come to the 19th century, 20, early 20th century. You have the Anglican missionaries, CMS, LMS, etc. They take the opposite route. These missionaries identified themselves with the local people. None of them ever acted as a high caste brand, not one. Yeah, many of them uh, sort of exuded the air of the British Raj and the distinction of being white and all that, that's fine. But I can't think of a single instance of a CMS missionary or LMS missionary who passed off himself as a Brahmin or equivalent to a Brahmin, okay? St Stanley Jones was a different person. He was, of course, American. Ah. He, he lived an astronaut life and so on, tried to follow that, Hindu. That's right, that's right. Yeah, that, that's the other, other trend, yes. Uh, there was another, oh, I forget his name, I forget. There was another oh. person who lived in South India. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. Uh, in, uh, in uh, yeah. It was a Spanish, it was a Spanish Catholic uh, me, 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 missionary. Anyway, so these people tried to indigenize themselves. Their attempt was not so much to project themselves as superior in caste as to create a kind of, um, let me say, genial atmosphere, genial to the, the Hindu, prospective Hindu converts. As a matter of fact, they were not uh, zealous, um, uh, uh, say, proselytes proselytizers, they were not very keen to convert people. They only wanted to create a, an interface between uh, Christianity and Hinduism. As a matter of fact, the Cambridge missionaries who founded St. Stephen's College in 1881, part of their mission, part of their purpose in establishing uh, the college was to create a platform for the continuous sharing of experiences, views, and insights between Anglican Christianity and Indian traditions. So that is another, another strand. And in fact, M.M. Thomas also belongs to that particular tradition. The attempt to bring these things together. Time for one more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
will make that the last. I'm just referring to the dispute between the Jerusalem the church leaders' authority versus Paul. Even though there was the dispute about the circumcision, they had a reconciliatory meeting and whereby yes, yes. They, 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 they brought down to a minimal uh, two or three things which excluded the circumcision. Yeah, that so, is right. so circumcision was not insisted uh, uh, from that time onwards as a mandatory or uh, compulsory thing. Yeah. And yeah, in I, that I was, context, was, can we... That I was uh, talking about the early that? conflict. I was yeah. talking about the early conflict. No, true, true. So and the that point context, is this. Yes, George, the point the is point, this. My Even point the, is, uh, so St. Thomas, when he came down to Kerala, hmm. probably this is one of the reasons why he did not insist on circumcision. Yes, yes. Now, even going back to the Jerusalem context, the Jerusalem group would not have changed their mind about the need for circumcision, but for the feedback from the non-Jewish world through Paul. You understand? That's one way in which you impact. And the, the question that Anne raised. Now, for example, if you look at the history of church union movement in India, it was the feedback from the missionary fields and the missionary experiences that highlighted to everyone that there is a need for Christian unity. And Church of South India and Church of North India are both churches that resulted from the church union movement. So this kind of uh, back and forth flow has happened in many places, except that today I find that it is over and nothing is happening. So George is absolutely right in the sense that after the uh, uh, Jerusalem Council of 56, a compromise formula was <coughs> worked out, mainly through the initiative of James, that uh, the Gentile converts to Christianity will not be required to undergo circumcision. That is true. But doctrinal differences remained. So those differences came to a head and that resulted in this massive conflict. They fell apart. And the other very interesting thing is, though Paul and Peter became rivals, and bitter rivalry it is not just something mild. Ironically, both ended up in the same place, Rome. More or less at the same time. And both were killed in Rome. But though it was Peter who came to be acknowledged as the Bishop of Rome, actually it was Pauline Christianity that prevailed. That's the irony of it. You understand? And Pauline Christianity, interestingly, in case somebody's interested in this, attempted to create a certain meeting point between Christianity and Roman Empire. That is why, for example, Paul, unlike Jesus Christ, says that all authorities must be respected. There is no authority except from, I think, uh, Romans chapter 3, 13 or something. There is no authority except from God, etc. There is no such teaching in Jesus Christ. And um, Paul's deferential attitude to secular authority, which, is, which comes to the fore on and off, is as a concession to the political context where he has to carry on with this work. Okay? Anyway, today it is a revision for me because all the time I have been under the impression that because Paul did not have any personal contact with Jesus during his lifetime, is true. and Paul having not read any of the any of the gospels or related books those days which were not available, yeah. his background with in the of training in orthodoxy under Gamaliel, it would have impressed his uh, uh, Christian uh, thoughts also, and probably that is why he made a lot of rules and regulations for okay. the church. Gamaliel was not a Christian, he was a Jew. No, uh, uh, the, the fanaticism comes from there, the fundamental orthodoxy comes from there. 
Yosef Farisi, Yosef Zealous. Yeah, he was. Some, yeah, they they are more fanatic in uh, their orders yes. and uh, absolutely, absolutely, and absolutely, practices yes. and tradition. So probably he had that influence in his mind, which he uh, unknowingly applied to Christianity also. Yes. And I thought that Peter, Paul, uh, Peter, James, and uh, um, John, they were more moderners, or I should say, liberal than uh, Paul in the matter of uh, uh, tradition. And orthodoxy. Yes. Now that you raised this, let me also say that Paul can be seen as suffering from a particular complex, namely, what exactly you referred to, that he was not associated with the living Jesus, unlike the other apostles. Now there is an operative definition of an apostle. An apostle is one who shared in person not by faith, in person, the public ministry of Jesus Christ. So that way only 12 can be apostles. One of them, of course, fell apart as we know. So one of the, one of the um, hindrances that Paul had to face was that he was not an apostle. So in his, in his epistles, he goes uh, you know, to, to great extents in asserting that I am an apostle, I am an apostle, I am an apostle. In fact, I am more an apostle than all of you. In fact, if you want, I can give you the specific uh, reference in the next slide. I have not noted it down now. He says, I, I, am, I have greater reasons, greater grounds to be proud of my calling as a, as a disciple. That is why he emphasizes his encounter with Jesus in Damascus. Uh, there, are, there is a school of theology which says that that particular experience which Paul claims and which is also recorded in the sixth chapter of Acts of the Apostles may not be historical at all. After all, after all, Acts of the Apostles was written by Luke. Luke was an ardent follower of Paul. Follower. Nobody else. So then you see, when Luke writes his gospel, the gospel according to Luke, that gospel assumes a particular uh, character. It's the most universal of all gospels. So Paul's emphasis on universality becomes the hallmark of Luke's account of the life of Jesus Christ. You understand? So therefore... Luke was a Gentile as well, wasn't he? A Gentile, yes. He was part of the Hellenic Christianity. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Paul takes particular pains to emphasize the fact that he's second to none as far as apostleship is concerned. And actually, it's in order to buttress, in order to validate or reinforce this claim that Paul tries to shift the emphasis away from the biographical details to the faith spiritual details. Because if you really remain stuck to biographical details, then Paul has to be inferior to the other apostles. In fact, Paul will not be considered an apostle because he did not relate physically to Jesus. Isn't there, isn't there one more point? Paul's letters were written before the gospels were written. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Paul's letters were written between 40 and uh, I think 70 AD. Whereas the first gospel is dated as Mark's gospel is dated around 70 AD. And the last of the gospels, which is John's gospel, is placed between 100 and 120 AD. So, that's, so uh, it's very interesting and uh, uh, good that Zach points it out. Notice that all the Gospels were written decades after the death of Jesus Christ. It has got its own implications, but let me not go into it. Okay, I think we'll close for the day. And the the defining faith, you said a phrase, living vital something. What was it? Faith uh, is living vital inspiration, no? Did you see that particular vital, word? Maybe vital force or something? Ah, vital force, yeah, okay. Living vital force. Thank you. Okay. So thank you. And 
I hope um, uh, the, the little details I'm sharing with you encourages you to read the New Testament again from a slightly different perspective, when actually these texts could come alive in a much, much more intense fashion. So uh, I hope it happens. Okay, thank you very much, and I look forward to a very to effective getting... paradigm shift, Achin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.